Well, good morning and welcome to Bridgeway. It is daylight savings time, which means that if you are in church today, you get an extra jewel in your crown. Uh, So again, hope you, uh, well, didn't enjoy your extra hour of lost sleep, but again, we're glad that you are here with us today. At Bridgeway, we are a church without walls. That is our vision. That is who we want to be as a church. And we talk about this a lot, uh, about our mission about what we're trying to accomplish in this community. And and for us, it's a three-part statement. It's about connecting. And the first thing we want to um, see from everyone, or see for everyone, rather, is that you can connect to God through Jesus and have a relationship with Him. Um, That is our hope and our prayer for you. We also want you to connect with others, which means that we believe that having relationships and deep friendships with other people is so important for you, um, not just for your spiritual growth, but really so you can go through life um, and, and endure the things that life brings your way. And then finally, we believe in connecting others to God, um, which is basically to say this, we're excited about Jesus. Uh, we believe that in, in him there's hope and there's joy, and we want to share that with everyone that we come in contact with. And so uh, whether you've been with us for a long time, from the, maybe even from the beginning of this church, or whether you've been coming the last uh, weeks or months, we want to invite you to be on this mission and this journey with us. So again, thank you for being here. Uh, before we open the Bible today, I want to lead us on a, on a, a very simple thought experiment. Okay, it's not going to take any uh, too much except for a little bit of brain power and your cooperation, and I know I have both of those things. Thank you, that person over there. Okay, here we go. So, so what I want you to do is I want you to think about the, the term Christian or Christianity or Jesus follower, whatever you want to, whatever you want to associate with that, um, call it a Christian. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a thought experiment, and I want you to, in your mind's eye, pick a picture or an object or some sort of metaphor that fully captures what it means to be a Christian. And there's only a couple of rules to this. You can't think about a person. So if you think about Jesus, you're not allowed to think about Jesus. Um, You're not allowed to think about someone wearing a robe and having a long beard. You can't think of that. It has to be an object like, I don't know, like an iPhone or something, which I wouldn't recommend. That just doesn't seem to bear it much into whatever. But you can pick whatever you want. Okay, so, so just with me, just think about that picture. Get that in your mind about what you think a Christian would be if you had to pick a picture. I wonder, out of all of the pictures, I wonder if maybe a few of us, if you have a church background, you might, you might be here. Maybe you think that a Christian is like a candle that shines light into a dark room, and actually that's in the Bible. Um, perhaps you view a Christian as, uh, as, as, a, as a judge's gavel, because being a Christian means that you're right and that other people are wrong. Maybe you have a different picture in your mind. But what I want to do today is we're going to actually look at some words from Paul. We're going to continue studying um, 2 Corinthians, which is the second letter that Paul writes to the church in Corinth. And we're going to see that Paul has a very specific picture in our mind that might be surprising to us. Um, It almost certainly would have been a surprise to the Corinthians that we are going to uh, read today. So if you have your Bibles, open with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. We are going to read, you know, pretty much the the rest of the chapter to set us up for for next week. So, if you have your Bibles, uh, verse 6 begins this way. Paul writes, for God, who said, let there be light in the darkness, has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God that is seen in the face of Jesus Christ. We now have this light shining in our hearts. So we haven't got to his analogy yet, but what Paul is doing is he's setting up what what he believes to be true about a person who has come to faith in Jesus. And and what Paul is doing here is he's he's making allusions or a reference to the creation story, which is found in the book of Genesis. Um, And my guess is that even if you don't have a church background, you probably have heard uh, some idea or some notion of how this all unfolds. 
So Genesis 1 begins with the earth being dark and voidless. Uh, it actually, some, some versions talk about uh, chaos. And so there's this sort of empty, kind of formless void. But then the first thing God does when he starts to create the world is just let there be light. And, and scripture tells us that through God's voice and through his words, all of creation comes into existence. So he creates light and he creates the heavens and the earth and the sky and the moons and chickens and all of these things through his word. And so what Paul was doing, he's helping us understand what happens when we place our faith in Jesus. He says in the same way that the, the world was formless and chaotic and dark, he says that's the, re- that's the condition of our souls apart from God. But God, through Jesus, shines his light into our hearts. And so he gives us light. He gives us life. And if you've been with us, you know that Paul thinks about this, this, this spiritual reality as indicative of what he calls the new way, which is a life that's empowered by and given by God's spirit. And it allows us to be changed from the inside out. So God shines his light in our hearts, and that begins to radiate out into the world. And so he's giving us this picture of what uh, happens in our lives when we put our faith and hope in Jesus. But then he says this, and this is uh, verse 7. He says, but we ourselves, being Christians, are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God, not from ourselves. And my guess is that uh, if you are a Christian or not a Christian, you have heard this allusion. In fact, today, this morning on the news as I was driving into church, um, someone mentioned about uh, a person in in kind of uh, popular life. They said, you know what, they're an imperfect vessel. And this was on like a secular radio station. I thought that was so fascinating. So, so this idea has kind of permeated in our culture, but I wonder if we really understand what it means. And if we're surprised by Paul uh, comparing Christians to fragile clay jars. My, my guess is that no one, unless you're a super Christian and you knew what we were going to be talking about today, my guess is that no one said that a Christian is like a cracked clay pot. That is my guess. I'm guessing you came up with a different analogy, um, a different picture, and a different notion of what a Jesus follower looks like. And so if you are perhaps a little bit surprised about this analogy, you would be right to be surprised. Certainly the Corinthians would have been surprised. And so what Paul is talking about here is when he says a fragile clay jar, um, the original Greek would have been somewhere around the idea of an earthen vessel. And this is something that um, people would have had readily available in their minds as a picture. And really what he's talking about here is is an everyday clay or ceramic pot or household implement that you would use. You would use an earthen vessel to wash, to wash your hands, to hold water, to cook, to do all sorts of things, just kind of day-to-day basic tasks. And so he says that we're like that. So what he's doing, though, is he's comparing this, uh, this earthen vessel, or what would have been called a common vessel, to something called an honorable vessel. So an honorable vessel This is something that you would have had if you were maybe a wealthy family, or perhaps if you were kind of a middle-class family, you would have an honorable vessel for special occasions. So for a a religious festival or a holiday, you would bring out this special jar that was was usually ornately decorated, and it, it had specific value, and you would bring that out, right? And so he's talking about these two things, and he's helping us to compare and to see by contrast what a Christian ought to look like, or perhaps what a Christian looks like. We'll talk about that at the end. So it's this idea like that we are, we are a, not that we are unimportant, but we are like your everyday bowl. We're like a, uh, a jar of sugar or something like that compared to the special grandmother's china that was in that always sits in that case uh, for me in my house we had an honorable vessel in my house and maybe you did too um, for birthdays 
we had a, did anyone else have this? It was a red plate. Okay, yeah, a few of you. A red plate, and it said, like, happy birthday, probably. Is that what it said? Yeah, it said happy birthday, and it was a special plate. And, and I will tell you, one, one, one um, year, someone dropped the plate, and it, it broke a little chip in it, and my mom was so concerned, and so she took, and she, she spent a lot of time repairing this plate because this plate had value. Now, compare this. If, if I was at your house and we were eating dinner, and if I said, will you please pass the salt, say, you wouldn't just give me a, 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 a teaspoon of salt in my hand, would you? No, that would be bizarre, at least if you do, so don't do that. What you would do is you would hand me a small glass or ceramic vessel that holds the salt so that I could put it on my food. And, and here's perhaps the important thing. A, a common vessel, an earthen vessel, a, a clay jar, it's not that it doesn't have value, it's that its value comes from that which it holds, not that which it is. Okay? So it, it's valuable, it's not, it's not, it might be insignificant, but it's not invaluable because it has something in it that means something. So you say, pass the salt, you would give me a container holding salt. And Paul says that's a little bit about what it means to be a Christian. And, and then he says this, he says, this fragile clay jar contains this or a great treasure. And so for Paul, what he's talking about here is very specific and it's very obvious given the context. He believes that the great treasure that is stored in this, let's be honest, not, ex, not, uh, not it's a great treasure held in an insignificant container. The great treasure is the good news about Jesus. It is the news that Jesus came into the world as God's only son, that he lived a perfect life, that he died a death for our sins, and he was raised back to life by God's power. And for, for Paul, this good news about Jesus is a great treasure. It is not an abstract theological concept. It is not something that he just listens to on a Sunday morning or sort of throws it around in sort of a haphazard way. No, Paul, Paul believes that the news about Jesus and what Jesus has accomplished is an actual treasure that is actually worth something. And, and we know this because we look at Paul's life and we see that Paul has rejected everything of value that the world has to offer, like a family, a permanent home, money, wealth, maybe even basic physical security, right? We see Paul is all the times is, is living without those things because he has believed and he, because he places actual worth on what Jesus has done. And he believes now that his entire purpose is about being a champion of this good news, and so, so you see here, when he's talking about a, a fragile clay jar, that's what he views himself as. Notice here that he does not say, I believe in Jesus, therefore now I am an honorable vessel. Now I am a, a noteworthy person. No, he does the opposite of that. And if you notice, Paul's going to talk about the reasons why he is broken, why he is fragile, but for him, he sees this as exactly the mystery that God has done. God has taken an imperfect vessel, something that's broken and something that doesn't have a lot of value in and of itself, and he has placed in it something of infinite value. And so this is why it's a little bit confusing here because now he starts talking about suffering. And read with me in verse 8. He says, We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. So again, he keeps talking about his trials. He talks about his trouble, his weakness, um, the things that to a, a Corinthian Roman culture would have disqualified him right? These are, these are things that when the Corinthians go to Paul, they are looking for an honorable vessel. They're looking for someone who is powerful, 
who has it all together on the inside, but also on the outside. They're, they're looking for someone to, to aspire to in, in their Roman culture. And Paul continually, not only does he fail to meet that expectation, he continually reminds him that he is failing that expectation. And he never allows himself to, to be put in a position where he talks about how good or how awesome he is or how he goes through things, but really it's a way of telling how good he is. He continues to talk about his weakness because later in this letter, he is going to tell us that, that God's strength and God's power is actually made perfect in our weakness, not in our perceived strength. Then verse 10 he says, Though suffer, or through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. Notice how he keeps talking about death and life here. So we live in the face of death but this has resulted in eternal life for you. And so what he's doing here is, in a sense, he's painting a picture about what it means to be a broken vessel. And what he's doing here is he's helping us understand brokenness and suffering in a dramatically different way than his immediate culture, cultural context understood it. So if, if you look at first, the first century, just like our, our world today, there are competing views and competing worldviews and, and philosophical views and religious views about how to live our lives. That's kind of our moment as well. And in, in Paul's day, there was a, a few leading, um, leading philosophies or sort of philosophical slash religious ideologies. And all of them tried to deal with suffering in a way. And if you look at, uh, for instance, writings of the Stoic philosophers, the Stoics would say that your suffering is all about your perspective, and we need to change our perspective so that we can go through our suffering, which is interesting because some, you know, you, I find that in kind of pop culture Christianity today, but that's just an observation. Um, you've got the cynics, and, and what they believed is that your response to suffering was what mattered. And then you have uh, Gnostics, and these were people who were kind of trying to work their way into Christianity that believed that suffering was simply just a, a remnant of the physical world that needed to be rejected so that we could get that special spiritual knowledge that saved us. You know, all, all that to say is that there were competing ideas, and they all tried to deal with suffering and what to do with it. And then here Paul comes in here, and he talks about suffering in a completely different way. So he, Paul looks at Jesus and tries to make sense of all of this, and, and, and so Paul realizes that Christianity and that Jesus specifically came into the world with a whole different approach to thinking about and working through suffering and even making sense of suffering. Uh, the first thing I think is so important is that Christianity, it recognizes suffering in a way that other religions and worldviews do not. See, in ancient times, just like in our, maybe our current, uh, our current moment, we view religion and we view spirituality and we view uh, really kind of our entire lives as a means to avoid or transcend suffering. We, we, we do this. We talk about how spirituality can help us transcend things. If you come from like a Buddhist perspective, it's about transcending suffering and denying suffering because that's not what is real. But then Christianity comes around. And then, then it, Christianity says that our central figure, which is Jesus, not only did he not transcend suffering in his earthly ministry, at least, that he actually experienced suffering and pain in a way that really no one else has ever experienced. And so that's a pretty bizarre thing. So, so Christianity recognizes suffering in a way that other religions do not or cannot. Um, and even, even kind of worse than that is that Christianity as a religion is actually an invitation to suffer and to press into our suffering. And that's really important for you to know, by the way. If you're kicking Christianity around and kind of checking out the uh, kind of the fine print of the Christian faith, it is an invitation to press into suffering. Christianity never promises 
that we can, through faith in Jesus, avoid or escape suffering. And that's really not very good PR. That, that's, not the, that's not the common way we want to view spirituality and religion. Again, you hear all the time, and even, even in Christian circles, in the Christian teaching, I hear it almost every week if you listen to a sermon on the internet or something. It's that Jesus is going to come into your heart, and he's going to make your life better, and he's going to make all the things that are bothering you, hurting you, making you suffer, he's going to take all of those things away now in this life. And, it, and it's very subtle here, but, but you have to realize that Christianity never makes that claim. In Jesus' earthly ministry, Jesus serves other people he suffers, he does without, right? He doesn't have a house, he doesn't have a job, he doesn't have a lot of earthly possessions. And then at the end of his ministry, what happens? He is taken by the Romans, flogged and executed in the most unimaginably barbaric way known to man at the time. That is the Christian teaching when it comes to suffering. Now, there is some good news at the end of this, and we'll get to that in just a minute, but what Paul is helping us understand is that when we are an imperfect, fragile clay jar, really the way that that is manifest in our life is through experiencing pain and suffering. But then he says this in verse 13, he says, we want, but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. And that's a reference to Psalm 116. You can read that on your own time, but it's just, it's a whole song about God saving us in the midst of our anxiety, of trouble, in our suffering, but it's not from our anxiety and suffering and trouble, but you can read that on your own time. Then, then, he, then he says in 14, and this is where the news starts to get better. He says, we know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. And all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. And so we, we've talked about how, how Christianity is different when it comes to suffering, but, but here's the good news about Christianity, is that Christianity promises the ultimate answer for suffering, for pain, and for death itself. And notice here, for Paul, it's not us getting some sort of respite from that in this life. For Paul, his hope and his confidence is in Jesus' resurrection. The fact that God, by His power, by the Spirit of God's power, God, power of God's Spirit, rather, Jesus is raised back to life after three days. And so for Paul, he knows that Jesus ultimately conquered suffering and pain and death through the resurrection. And so now Paul says, because we are in Christ, and when we experience that same pain and suffering that Jesus experienced, we will also experience the same resurrection that Jesus experienced. And for Paul, that is very, very good news. And what for Paul, it is, it is recalibrated everything that he believes about the world, everything that he believes about his own personal experience and suffering, because now he realizes that the hope is for Christians and for people who call on the name of Jesus is that in the future we will be resurrected, and that means that we will have earthly, real bodies. They're not going to be the same bodies, but they will be a, a bodily resurrection that we will get to follow Jesus in. That's why Paul is excited. That's why Paul looks at pain and suffering in a very different way than how his culture looked at it. And frankly, that's sometimes the difference between me and Paul. Is I, if I'm honest, sometimes still want Jesus to take away things that are causing me trouble, things that are causing me to suffer. And I kind of think that Jesus, since I love you, you should take that away from me so that I can live a better life here and now. And perhaps I'm the only one who experiences that. But I, I think that's oftentimes what we place as our hope in Jesus. But Jesus and Paul points us to the ultimate victory, which is resurrection. We'll keep going. He says, that is why, verse 16, 
That is why we never give up. We never give up because we're confident about the resurrection. And it says, though our bodies are dying, our spirits or our inner being in the Greek are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Quick, quick word there. Paul is not saying that your struggle is small or he's not, he's not making your struggle or your pain insignificant, right? Paul understands what it means to have pain, and so he'd be the last person to say, oh, it's just not a big deal. But Paul is saying, though, compared to what is coming, compared to an eternity, compared to a resurrection life, then our problems are small compared to that. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So, we don't look at the troubles. Now, Paul is going to start telling us to do something. So, we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone. But the thing we cannot see, the things we cannot see will last forever. And so now Paul is, is, is telling us now, okay, in response to all of this, don't look at our current troubles and, and present circumstances. And actually the word, when, he, when you look at don't look, don't look is the, is the word that's translated as the mark or the finish line. So he's saying, don't make the troubles and the things that we experience now the ultimate goal and finish line. And that's something for me is something I struggle with because I want to make the absence of pain, um, me having a feeling like I'm living a better life, sometimes I make that the goal of how well my life is going and how well my, my faith is going, how well my, my walk with Jesus is going, right? I, you, we always ask ourselves, how are we doing? We say, oh, things are good. You know, the, the boys are starting to sleep through the night. I've got little kids, and so I'm, I'm looking at everything that in my life that is moving up and to the right, as my marker and barometer for success. And Paul says, just don't do that. Don't make that the goal. Instead, we set our eyes, we make our priority or the finish line things that we cannot see, namely the resurrection, because we haven't seen that for ourselves yet. He says that is our ultimate goal, which then changes the way that we relate to our brokenness and our suffering now. And so, so Paul is saying that we need to have, we need to def define the right finish line when it comes to our faith so that we can never give up because of our hope in the resurrection. And so you see here, this has kind of been a, a, a weird conversation, right? So Paul talks about, he talks about being a jar of clay, okay? Then he talks about suffering, he talks about the resurrection, and then he says we need to have the right finish line. So, so what exactly is it that ties all of these things together? And so I, I keep coming back to Paul's initial statement where he says, says, we have this light shining in us. We have, we have the Spirit of God living in us. But then he, then, he says, then he says, so, or therefore, or because we have his light, we are like fragile clay jars. He says, that is what it looks like. And so I was thinking about, what does that mean? Because sometimes I look at the words of Paul, and I, I read something like, hey, we're like fragile clay jars, and I make a small error. I then start thinking about, well, how do I become like a fragile clay jar? How do I become like this? But Paul doesn't say you need to become like a clay jar, like a, like a common cracked a common vessel. He says you are a common vessel. You are an earthen vessel. You are like a broken piece of pottery. Not that we need to become that. So, so then the question is not, not how do we become a broken clay jar, a fragile clay jar. It's how do we authentically acknowledge that we are a broken vessel. And I think that's a big difference. When I think about my life with Jesus, it is very easy for me to say, well, I have Jesus inside of me, therefore I now am something of value and of worth, and you all should look to me. 
But what Paul says is something incredibly different. Paul says, no, I have a great treasure inside of me, yet look at how broken I am. Look at my weaknesses, look at the ways that I fall short and that I don't, ma- or I don't live up to the expectations of my world. And in a sense, what he's doing here is he, he's telling us something important. He says that when we understand that we are broken, but God has chosen that brokenness as the, as the way that he wants to show his power and his strength and his goodness, that changes the way that I relate to the world. It helps me to, to have the same kind of humility that Paul said, that Paul has. Because if we really view ourselves as broken, we, we're going to be authentic to that. And it was interesting. Last week we talked about integrity. And integrity doesn't mean that we always get it right. It means that we are authentic and honest when we get it wrong. And I once heard a pastor say that, um, he said it's interesting that, that people will, will, will always be impressed by your strengths, but they will connect with you through your weaknesses. And so when we are open and honest like Paul is about the ways that he struggles, about the ways that he himself is inadequate, what it does is it helps people see the great treasure inside of you. And when, when Paul talks about a, a cracked clay jar, I can almost just envision little rays of light poking through the cracks. And he says that when we are authentically following Jesus, we will show um, our humility we will, we, will, we will we'll help people understand that we're the salt shaker, not the birthday plate. And that what makes me valuable is not who I am, but what I hold and what is inside of me, namely God's spirit. It's, it's interesting, when, when I think about this, this picture of what a Christ follower looks like, I think back to Jesus' words. And Jesus, when he gives the the most famous sermon of all time, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, he doesn't begin it by saying, blessed are those who have it all together. Blessed are those who are able to put on a facade and to make everything look really good in their lives. Uh, Blessed are those who are always right. Blessed are those who have the right theology. Blessed are those... He doesn't say that. Jesus says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who understand that they have a deep need for God and that they they understand how broken and how fragile they are. He says, blessed are the meek, not the powerful. He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. And, And what Jesus is describing is exactly the same thing that Paul is pointing us to. He says when we have God's life and God's spirit living inside of us, it helps us to understand our brokenness. It helps us to understand how we are inadequate compared to God's strength, and it helps us to point other people to the hope that we have inside of us. And that is a a dramatically different picture than I see many Christians, myself included, trying to live out each and every day, because let's be honest, I want you to think that I'm strong, I want you to think that I've got it together, and I want you to think that I'm real, so I'll let you know like how I screw up in like my 25 cent sin ways, but I don't want you to see how I'm really flawed, and how I'm really broken, and how I really struggle, because that, that doesn't make me look good. And Paul says, yeah, that's the point. He's saying when you acknowledge your brokenness to God and to others, God's strength and God's power will be manifest in your weakness because when I am weak, then he is strong. Let's pray together this morning.